Uh, hello, everybody. James here, Franchise University with Shane Douglas himself. There he is, the famous three fingers. <laughs> this crooked fingers. <laughs> the most famous three crooked fingers in wrestling. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking about... Uh, I hate to say we're going to be talking about NWA TNA completely because we're going to be talking about a very specific show over the course of two parts where you headline with Raven in a hair versus hair match. Plenty of stuff on that, of course. But what I also do... If you've been watching this podcast from the beginning, you'll know that I also surround the show that we review with a lot of news from the time as well, some contemporaneous news of the time. And uh, if there are any plugs I'm trying to think of, I wrote them down three weeks ago, and I don't know where they are. Anyway, (laughs) uh, five stars on iTunes are out every Tuesday, YouTube channel, you know, that kind of thing. So, Shane, I'm going to give you some news stories of this show that takes place September 17th, 2003. So in the run-up, we have a few of these... Uh, tidbits, and I'm going to throw some at you now. Scott Hall legally settles with AOL Time Warner in his favour over merchandise royalties. Alexis Lurie of TNA was offered a developmental deal to go to OVW, and it looks like she has accepted, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Uh, so that means that TNA doesn't get Mickey James. So if uh, I don't suppose you've got any memories of Mickey James in the early days, do you? Not not in the early, early days, uh, but all my recollections of her was that she was always hardworking, uh, always had a great personality, you know, smiling and uh, the type of person you always like to be around. Uh, she, but or that far back, I, you know, again, in, in my brain, everything's sort of compressed. So I can't remember, like, it was my earliest recollections, her pre WWF, but I do remember her being in TNA. So I don't know if. Her run came before that, after that, but she was always a pleasure to work with. And, and there, uh, prior to TNA, uh, when I was helping uh, a local promoter there in Nashville run some shows there, uh, she was always easy to work with. I believe she was in a couple times there and, uh, you know, professional. So next is China changes her name to China Doll due to a WWE trademark uh, infringement, essentially, which uh, I remember the China Doll days, I must say. And apparently there was also around this time on September 13th a backstage fight between Shane Helms and Rodney Mack, which I had no idea of and, <laughs> until I, I, it was... Someone was blowing off someone's suggestions in the back with the match. You know how that goes. Yeah, um, yeah. WWE.com has an article on Chris Nowinski and post-concussion syndrome problem. He would never make it back to wrestling. We've been talking about concussions quite a lot on mm. this show. And also, you were talking about you know the film Concussion, the book as well. A doctor, uh, He's not doctor, but uh, Chris Nowinski might as well be a doctor, quite frankly, for all the mm. education he's gone through and all the uh, <laughs> uh, research he's done on concussions. Have you ever met right. Chris? I have, yeah. Uh, and I spoke to him after the uh the whole chris benoit incident i hmm. uh, and i forget why he had contacted me um <laughs> concussions i can't remember uh no he it, and, and i was asking him things about like the the conclusion that he had a brain of a 75 year old and you know things like that that uh uh he uh you know he was i can't remember again i if the brain institute started after that or before that but he was like uh, on the early edges of that, right? I mean, he was, uh, you know, in some of the earliest, you know, like this is after Benjamin Amalu had uh, first diagnosed it and the the sports world had started taking a much bigger look at it. And Chris, with his smarts, was able to put together, hey, let's let's be on the front edge of this. And uh, I remember, like, when I talked to him, him because I was asking him several questions about, like, well, this and that, and, like, you know, what, how would he have been able to get through the day exhibiting with a 75-year-old brain? And, uh, you know, he, he was giving me like the textbook type answers that still didn't quite answer it fully to me. And, uh, as I recall, there was supposed to be a follow-up conversation and, and he never called back for that. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it obviously, and, and, and without belaboring the point, this is a big, big issue, not just in wrestling, but everywhere. And, you know, for those of us that come like from my generation or around my generation, where we were sort of sloughed on, like, it's no big day. It's no big deal. Like it's, it's, it's you don't have to have cast on your leg or whatever, so you're fine. Uh, it's a whole lot more than that. Does not necessarily be uh, depending on the severity of it. But you know, if your kids get their bell rung or something, take that seriously because that brain's in, still in development. 
Now, uh, this next story I will harp on a bit more. Mick Foley was a guest on the season premiere of TSN's Off the Record on the 1st of September. Uh, you never appeared on Off the Record, did you? Did you? But I remember it being a big deal at the time because it was like the only yeah, time like big WWF stars actually do an in-depth interview. Right. Yeah. yeah. They. Uh, yeah. They had an inside lane because it was easy to contact the Fed and and they were getting the exposure for it. So apparently, these shows take a week earlier, and Mick Foley was promoting his book at the time. I think it was Titan Brown, so that was his first novel. And the big story of his appearance is that he was rather hurt at some uh, stuff that Hulk Hogan had said about him quite recently Hmm. at that time. So the quote is, I would probably say I've trained more in the last week than Mick Foley has trained in 30 years. I went ahead when Mick Foley was eating cheeseburgers and eating M&Ms. I was in the gym. I did it every day for 30 years. It It depends nowhere you want to be. The early bird ain't no worm. Bit of a confusing last sentence there. But uh, (laughs) anyway, so Mick on this show then responds to Hulk Hogan saying, he's arguably the biggest star that's ever been in the business. To hear that come out of his mouth is about the most damaging thing I've ever heard. He noted Hogan said it when his book came out and pointed out how his two books greatly outsold Hogan's book. For him to say he's trained more in a week than I have in 30 years is just insulting, and it's a lie. He said they should ask Rock, Austin, and Michaels if he was in shape when they did their long matches. Foley did admit one of the reasons he retired was because of all that his extra weight hurt his knees and back, but he said if Hulk Hogan would have wrestled me in his career, he would sound more or less like a whiny girl in a porn film, saying not so fast and not so hard because he wouldn't like the contact. So... (laughs) That's an interesting back and forth, and I'd completely forgotten about this, the Hulk Hogan, Mick Foley uh, back and forth at one point. Do you remember this at the time? Uh, I do. I, I didn't remember specifics till you read through them. But uh, Mick was, and I think I'd mentioned this before on the show, Mick is a sensitive guy. Hmm. You know, he's, uh, uh, you know, pl- the gruff character that he plays and everything is very, very different, like we've said about a lot of us. And... Uh, you know, like hearing that because he was such a fan of wrestling and, and, and a fan of Hogan's, you know, that I think like in, in his respect, uh, in his life, like hearing that coming from like one of the guys that he really looked up to, uh, was, a was jarring for him. But I think also in that comment and his response, you can also see mixed intelligence, right? Uh, there's a bit more going on there, uh, than just a shot for shot or tit for tat. And, uh, you know, like, to, to make a play on Hulk's words, if you're going to go after Mick like that, you better sharpen up the blades because, you know, he's he's going to come back at you. And he's one of those guys that's sharp enough to put an attack into like a real nice, soft, easy package. You know, that was a pretty cool thing he said about me. And you go like, hey, wait a second, <laughs> maybe not, <laughs> you know, he uh, uh, but, you know, Mick, Mick worked hard. I don't think Mick worked hard in the gym. You know, I, I, he, in my experience of being around him in those early years, we would go into the gym and he would ride the bike, but it would be like, mm. you know, him like talking and stuff. He, it, it wasn't his, his Ballywick. And, uh, you know, it, much like I've learned over the years, again, with just a bit of wisdom of time, you know, there's, you know, we were coming to the wrestling business at a time when it was massive bodies, like, you know, bodybuilder central. And, uh, You know, Mick had seen a vision, excuse me, for a character that hadn't been seen in wrestling before. And to do it in such a way, because of his intelligence, he could take that and wrap it around and and do something again. You go back and you watch the semantics of his moving in the ring. Looks unorthodox and quirky. Steve Austin, by the way, in a very different vein, same type of thing. But their foot placement, their positioning, uh, timing on, on and off spots is impeccable. And so, you know, I, I think Hogan probably at that time is, you know, because he was a body guy and you see a guy like Mick coming in and now suddenly, you know, the, he's had his other books out. They've been very successful. And, you know, there's a, a an attempt, I think, to try to stay relevant. And by stepping on toes like that, and, and you know, people are obviously going to, like, like they did at the time, talk about it. But I, I think there's little placement into, like, how are your words landing? You know, it's, uh, and I'm guilty of that. It probably is more than most, 
yeah, but I just have a tendency to 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 speak off mind and and, and what comes to head. And uh, uh, Mick w- would would go back on that. You know, he he would he would not shy away from it, and he would do it in a way like he did there. You know, like a sort of a kid gloves slap back, and then as it goes on, it gets a little bit more terse. Uh, and, and Mick Mick is <laughs> a sharp tool when it comes to that kind of <laughs> stuff. You know, bright guy. Um, I, I it's. And I'm sure Terry Hogan would say the same thing now. Like, you know, look, like for the life of me, when I came back from WWF, I could not understand how Sandman was such a big thing in ECW. <laughs> Again, me, my head at my rear end. Uh, and then it's like, I had the epiphany one day as, I, as he's making his entrance and, and he's out there like dumping beer down people's throats. And I, I looking at the people and I thought, they love him because he's one of them. He's just like them. And and again, I don't mean that in any condescending way. Uh, there's a thousand paths uh, to, to success in wrestling in any entertainment. And, you know, there might be similarities. Your path might be different from mine and mine's going to be different from the next person's. But, it, you know, it's, it, especially now with the hindsight of, of uh, 30 years to be able to point to, really impossible to look at Mick Foley and say, well, he wasn't quite that successful or, or wasn't as successful as me or whatever, uh, because you're, you're comparing two things from two disparate points. And Hogan was massive in his day. But I would also argue that Mick, in his own way, was on par, you know, maybe a hair behind because Hogan's one of those rarefied people that got that primo spot and WWF then, you know, had gone to places nobody could envision. But Mick, by any stretch of the uh, of the measurement has been successful in wrestling i'm sure vince would come out and say hey made this much money with mick foley and uh you know it's i i think for those of us coming into the business at that time that so looked up to and idolized these guys that we had watched missed the point that they're also human beings and you know as you're getting older you know you start to realize hey i can't quite do this i i you know hogan at that age even then couldn't go out and take the bumps or maybe ever that Mick did. And Mick found a different way to success coming from a completely different vantage point than most people in wrestling had. And it's easy before you see that to say, that's never going to work because it had never been seen before. And yet Mick came in and found a way to that Nirvana land of success in wrestling that we, you know, uh, you know, what is that old saying? Success has a a thousand mothers, Mm -hmm. uh, but failure is an orphan. Uh, you know, nobody would have gone on a limb from that generation at that time and said, okay, this kid with this weird body and this weird hair and look and unorthodox style, it's going to work because it was so different in wrestling when he was coming in. But having been the guy that worked with him when he's first breaking into wrestling and, uh, you know, Mick was diligent, hardworking, uh, Never took shortcuts except in the gym. He just didn't like being in the gym. Hmm. Uh, but he, nobody could ever make the accusation to Mick Foley that he was lazy, uh, took shortcuts, um, didn't put his time in because he was the guy. If you ever saw like, like the process of him writing those books, he had a thousand legal tablets and writing stuff down. And this was like a really well thought out mm. uh, process that he was undertaking. He approached his wrestling in much the same way. Um, different than today where we didn't talk stuff over, but when Mick had to get his heat, he would get his heat. And when it was time for him to take those bumps to get you over, he would take those bumps to get you over. And so, uh, you know, Mick has earned his way. Now we're going to be sticking with Hulk Hogan in the news because on the 12th of September, Jeff and Jerry Jarrett meet with Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart in Tampa. Now, it's a four-hour meeting to negotiate Hulk Hogan coming into TNA. Now, you were in the company at the time. I'm sure you'll remember there was a big video where I think Hulk Hogan was in Japan doing some new uh, for New Japan. Jeff Jarrett comes into a news conference and smashes a guitar over his head. And it's one of the big... Uh, storylines of quite frankly that year and it leads to absolutely nothing because Hulk Hogan wouldn't come into the <laughs> company for another six years yeah. uh, so in the early days of late 2003 2004 
What do you know of Hulk Hogan's potentially coming into TNA at this time? I had remembered until you started mentioning the the spot with the guitar. And I remember the thinking in the company was like, this, it's going to be eyes on, on the company. Right. And that was the, they were still in that building process of trying to get TNA established and, and over. Um, and, and I think the mindset was like, Hey, this will be good for us in the sense that eyeballs will be looking at it. Uh, I had always had the reticence of, you know, knowing the, of the stories that I'd heard about Hogan, you know, not wanting to put people over and things like that. But oddly enough, I had seen the same thing. <clears throat> when I first arrived in TNA, Jeff and I sat down and I said, like, what, hey, what do you see like here? You know, I said, well, I, only, one thing only makes sense to me is that, you know, I had thrown the NWA belt in the garbage can some years earlier and my reasoning for being in TNA should be now I've come to finish the job. I should have always done this back then. Instead of just throwing it down, I should have melted the damn thing down. I should have thrown it in the Schuylkill river river um, and come after it. He goes, he sat and he listened. And, okay. 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 And then if you look at the booking beyond that, I was never anywhere near Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> it's uh, you know, and I think the fans are probably thinking like, there's a 9,000 pound, elephant in this room the nwa title and that that idiot's here um so you know there, there's there was a lot of that that goes on in wrestling and a lot of guys have very sensitive egos in the business you know i'm always well aware that when i win or i lose i'm not really winning or losing it, this is somebody else's call and so i was always a bit of like almost like cringy you know like, like oh, really you don't want to do this? come on like this is this is what we do. Right. And, uh, but there's a lot of it. And uh, if you go back and look, a lot of the people that exhibited that type of behavior have been very successful in the business. So it's like the business sort of accepted that they're going to do this as well. You know? So, uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a preponderance of uh, permitting that in the business. So when somebody, you know, comes in that, you know, tries to flex those muscles and say, well, I don't really want to, lose the so-and-so uh are they exhibiting i'm gonna be like hulk hogan or i'm gonna be like rick flair or i'm gonna be like you know this person or that person um you could see how they could confuse the two of those uh especially for young kids coming into the business that don't really quite understand it you know and then you and you can't until you've been in it for some number of years so yeah i, I remember that but even when he would come in there later like after uh uh Jeff and his father had sold it uh, or, you know, had the investment from, uh, from the uh, orders. I had had this very discussion with Dixie and I never, ever had any discussion with anybody saying you should or shouldn't work with this person. That's not my place to do that. And, and uh, you know, I would, <laughs> I'm sure other people have done it with me, but I would hope that they wouldn't uh, because you as the person running the company, you have a better idea of what it is you need and what it is you want and what are your goals and objectives. And will this talent or that talent get you there? But I, I was clear with her as to like, be very careful with certain people. There are certain people that have reputations in our business that are more than willing to take your money and won't care if you earn their money back. And uh, so like after I had left TNA, it was impossible for us to get Dixie on camera prior to that. Dixie, the, the, the preeminent vision in my head of Dixie's are doing this. I'm management, not on air talent, finger and face. Um, so later when I turned on and I see her, you know, standing next to Hogan doing the crab or getting power bombed through the table by three, uh, by, uh, uh, Bubba and Devon. Uh, I thought, well, somebody has been smitten by the bug, <laughs> mm. you know, somebody that didn't want to before is finally found that camera. Um, but, you know, it was at that moment, just coming in, there was a lot of thought that this is going to get, uh, I mean, let's face it, Hogan at that time was a big name. And, uh, you know, that was going to put a lot of eyeballs on us. My guess would be that there was probably some reticence because you know, him taking the guitar, he realizes like working with Jeff and Jeff and his dad own the company and whatever else. He, you know, these guys that have approached the business from a political standpoint, again, they a lot of times those those bigger names that we've heard do that and get away with it have basically been rewarded for doing it as opposed to being rewarded for being the company guy and helping the company succeed and whatever else. 
Now, two more bits of news. Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar will have their well-regarded Iron Man match on WWE SmackDown the day before this TNA show, with Lesnar regaining the WWE Championship. And now, let's move on to TNA stuff again. Recent TNA shows have been an improvement. Audience reactions are better. Apparently, there is a never-ending battle of wills between Vince Russo and Jeff Jarrett over creative at this point. So... Is that the way you remember it in 2003 in the early days? No. Uh, the way I had seen I, I saw mo more of what I perceived as Jeff and Russo being on the same page. Mm. I think a lot of that that we've since come to find out has been weaned over the years of these stories being told that it wasn't quite what it looked like in real time sitting in situ in the building. But it's like a unified um, front kind of thing, at least. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because in the production meetings, like, they would come in and Jeff and he would, okay, we were, they would confer with each other and talk. It seemed very professional and, you know, like never like, oh, boom, I want to go left and you want to go right. It was never like that kind of loggerheads, at least in front of us. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I had never seen that playing out now again in, in hindsight looking back i was wearing multiple hats uh, for the company as an agent and on camera and different things so i was you know skidded around a good bit but you i do recall now started to hear like stories of like somebody coming in and talking shit about russo uh or talking about jeff and but then like when you'd see those two together they you know it was like this you know, it didn't seem, and so in our business where there's a whole lot of scuttle, but when the wrestlers have a lot of time on their hands and you're not keeping them busy, point A to B, they'll start to fill it up with the drama in between, right? A lot of those old school type tactics and things of, you know, hey, hey James, I thought you and Shane were friends. Uh, I thought you guys got along. He was talking the other day, he was really saying some bad things about you. Just those little things like that, that I think was probably more at work there. And and I think with Russo, uh, he's like any of those guys. You know, if if you get like a Bischoff and a Russo and a Paul Heyman, guys like that that have done that at that level, they're usually the ones that have best figured out the politics of the place, and so know how to like to walk that line and sort of skirt over it because there's going to be the public image and and then the the private private image, and a lot of times these guys are smart enough to play it off that way. So like if something leaks out about like, Hey, the, you know, Jeff and, and, and Russo were at each other, uh, you know, they would certainly be smart enough to know, like to go into that production meeting and each of them, they might've just been strangling each other 30 mm -hmm. seconds ago, but coming through that door, boom, like you said, unified front. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that those comments didn't jive with my memory of what I remember seeing. Right. So with Vince Russo and Jeff Jarrett, they were thick of sleeves, you know, from W, well, maybe WWF through WCW and in TNA for quite a few years. Looking at it, they're not uh, friends or friendly now, I don't think. But what was it about these two? Because you think Jeff Jarrett's as old school as old school gets for a guy of his age. Vince Russo mm. is the complete opposite. So how did those two just, why were these just so sort of connected for all those years? When surely, when looking at the outside, you think they'd be creatively as far apart as possible. Yeah, and, and probably were creatively. Uh, I, I think, Ru again, Russo, knowing the landscape, like you, you're going to come in. Uh, Vince and I had always gotten along very well, regardless of what was going on on camera at the time. And he would he was the one that came to me and said, hey, I just you know want to smarten you up, like be on the lookout for this. you know." And, and then he would tell me something. And I'd be on the lookout for it. Then I would see something in that rear its head. Uh you know, so uh, he, it's obvious to me that he was very intelligent. And, and look, if you work with Vince, you're, you're going to pick these traits up because you have to have eyes in the back of your head, on the bottom of your ass, on the bottom of your shoes when you're working for Vince because there's, everybody is constantly trying to get in behind you to stab you in the back and do all those things. And that's the exhaustive part of the business. I think I always thought to myself, like, man, you people have a lot of time on your hands. Like, mm. Jesus, I'm having trouble getting a meal in today. And you, and you guys have gotten 18 hours of crap done you know, behind people's back before noon. Uh, 
uh, they, but, but Russo having survived up there and succeeded in WWF would have learned those. And so the first thing to do in any wrestling company is who's got the stroke, who doesn't, uh, you know, butter your way up to that and stay in tight with that. Uh, and mean seemingly straddling the fence when you're around other people, like coming to me and saying, Hey, Jeff's dad saying this about you or whatever. And, you know, and, and trying to find that, that, commonality i guess between everybody but you're also dealing in wrestling with an awful lot of egos right we been guilty we all have egos or we wouldn't be in this business uh, or certainly successful in it uh so you, you know you can play that for or against if you if you're smarter than how to do it and i would maintain like a guy like vince and i'm not saying that he's doing this like as a you know like as a as part of his basic mo but if you're, you know, what's the old saying? Like, if you're, don't, don't get an ass kicking contest if you're a one legged man. Uh, Vince, he's got four legs, you know, having worked for Vince and been successful there. And so he's going to go into those and know, you know he, but Jeff growing up in it, same thing. So I'd pr you'd probably see a whole lot of, if you could be that proverbial fly on the wall, you would see the love in when these guys are in the same room together. And then when they're in the room with somebody else, the knives coming out. Uh, I wouldn't take that as being anything more with Vince and, and Jeff as being anything more than between any booker and wrestler or company owner and booker, uh, you know, all the different dynamics that are at work there. Uh, and, and there's a ton of them uh, because of our business being at work. So, so in 2003, and I'm actually going to give you a, a tiny bit of a clue here but, uh, before I uh, say, well, the question is, who was the creative team at this point in September 2003? Now, Dirty Dutch Mantel is not there until October. So I think he's the newest signing. Either very late September or early October, Dutch comes in. But just before Dutch comes in, who is the creative team? Russo was there um, when I came in. <clears throat> um, Bob Ryder was there and would contribute, although it wasn't like a technical part of the creative team. But I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeff uh, and later Dixie would go to Bob quite often because he'd been so much around wrestling. Uh, so he was sort of like an unofficial head to it. Uh, his dad, uh, Jeff's dad, who I'd never known prior to working in TNA. I knew of him, of course, but I, I hadn't ever met him and my experience in working with him, I remember I got Russo coming to me and telling me, hey, Jeff's dad's saying this or that. And what was being said was, like, if I say, say my on cameras weren't till five o'clock and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> I might lay down in the green room and take a nap. You know, just what else am I going to do? I could walk out there and sit up in the stands like everybody else and do nothing, or I could take a nap and I got a long day ahead. So, well, that somehow turned into, I was doing drugs when I'm taking a nap. And I said, well, have I, is there something that you guys wanted me to do that I missed? Because like, quite frankly, what I'm doing on my own time, when I'm not scheduled to be doing something with all due respect, everybody F off. This is my time. If I want to nap, if I want to go in and stick my finger up my rear end and pay somebody's uh drinking glass, that's for me to decide. And uh, concurrent to that, we had been working, I had been working on a contract and the contract kept coming back in different ways. And we had just, me and Jerry Lynn had just been offered, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the lead, uh, uh, not coaches, but, uh, uh agent rules. I was going to be the heavyweight division, him the light, the X division. And my ex-wife, one of the few things she, she said that made sense with the business because she really didn't care about wrestling. She said, uh, you know, one of the big sticking points up to that point of with the contract was merchandising. And she asked me, she said, well, if you're not going to be in the ring anymore, won't that affect your merchandise sales? And I thought, yeah, pretty good point. So I went back uh, to his dad, uh, Jeff's dad. And I said, uh, or I raised that point. I said, Hey, you know, we're, we're almost there. I said, but because I'm going to be leaving the ring to do this, my merchandise sales are, and that was like something we'd worked on for months and months to get those numbers right. I said, as long as I could get something extra per week, you know, 300, 400, 500 bucks extra a week, just to offset the fact that I don't have to be selling merch anymore. 
And he dismissed me out of hand. He went like, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't think you were right for the business, but thank you. And Russo was standing right there. And I went to grab him by his I was so pissed off because the question that I asked was a completely business question. It had nothing to do with, I ain't putting him over. Or, no, I won't lay down for that person. This is a, a complete, and this guy's a business, supposed to be a businessman. And Russo grabbed my hand as he turned like and, <laughs> and pulled it down. And, uh, you know, and, and it was just like that kind of relationship. Now I later would get along great with him, uh, you know, and working with him. Cause I think he saw that I was coming from much the same place that he'd always been in wrestling. And, uh, you know, there was a, uh, there was a push pull relationship there with him. And I think he did that by design, you know, like again, having run Memphis as long as he did, and then would later go to the fed and you know, different places. And, uh, you know, would, you know, be instrumental in the business for quite a many years. The, I'm, I'm certain that there was a whole lot of game gamesmanship going on there. Like, okay, this, well, if I walk away from it like that, you're not going to ask for any more money. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it also, in full disclosure, coincides with the time that I am right nearing the point of getting off the OxyContin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there was a lot of different things going on at the time, and not to be, the least of which was my marriage was foundering. So when I would come to work here and close all that stuff out, put that in a box and leave that behind, and then walk into the building and go and do my duty as as a, an on camera or behind the camera agent. Uh, it was impossible for me to just forget about those things that are going on at home right now and just come in here and be this guy. And, and I would try to keep that in a, in a package as much as I possibly could. But as a human being, there were times when it like little things like that would bring the fangs out and, uh, you know, ready to, to lash out. And, uh, you know, it, it, because of all those things going on once, it was not a very fun time in my career. You know, there was a you know, juggling a whole lot of balls, including at home. And, you know, like to me, I was suddenly not getting the, uh, the best part of what I always loved about wrestling was the camaraderie, uh, the downtime, the fun of being in the ring. All those things that made wrestling enjoyable to me suddenly – had become a chore. It was like an anchor around your neck as you're trying to juggle this heavy anchor and all these other things are going on. You know, it'd be just like in, in the real world of being alive, you know, your phone would ring halfway through the day as this thing just happened. And it's some BS from home. Uh, you know, it would just turn itself up. Uh, so not a real enjoyable time. And I, my guess is, and I've never talked to Jerry about this because, you know, Jerry and I had always been close. You know, Jerry's such a good guy. Uh, you know, so that I would confide things in him and, you know, he'd give me his feedback and, and, you know, what he thought or whatever. And I would go to him and I'd say, like, oh, man, it's just, it's got this text or this phone call. Or not a text them, but like a phone call. And, you know, it's this or that. And meanwhile, I got, you know, Jeff's dad over here saying that. And, you know, and, and he was always sort of like the even keel, like, it, you know, sort of taught me down a few pegs and, you know, like, like get it put under. And then that would last until the very next time that some other BS would, would, would rear its head. And uh, my guess is I, I, I'm going to have to ask Jerry like, what I was like to work with at that time, because I'm, I'm guessing I probably wasn't the easiest franchise to work with. Um, yeah. So all, all those things started to be like such a convoluted answer, but like that, that really in my head is how it is. There was like a whole lot, it's like being in the middle of a maelstrom of bullshit, mm. you know, and it just kept coming and kept coming And the places where you typically wouldn't get it, like in the wrestling dressing room or whatever, suddenly it's getting you there too. And it just kept coming and it was like impossible, you know, at, at some point you just wanted to lash back, you know, and, and fight back. And thank God for it. Russo was that day as I reached mm. out to grab Jeff, Jeff's dad, the uh, caller. Cause it was, uh, little tense time in the franchise's life. Now we're going to get to the show itself. I'm going to be racing through quite a lot of these matches. We're going to be focusing more on the major segments, and I'll ask you some questions along the way. So there's a package <clears> of <throat> Disco Inferno uh, helping Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger. Defeats America's Most Wanted for the NWA Tag Team titles, leading to a four-way tag match to determine the number one contenders later in the show. Mike Tanay welcomes us to the show, and a sign in the crowd is focused on saying Triple H fears AJ Styles. 
Yeah. Bored strippers who don't strip dance in the cages. So at some point they, <laughs> so at some point they managed to get. <laughs> at one point they went down to one stripper, like I'm presuming yeah. budget cuts, and then they've gone back to two. <laughs> so apparently business has gone a little better at the moment. <laughs> now uh, the first match: BG James and Ron Killings. Now three live crew come out, and I knew it was going to be a tag match. This four way thing, and I already written. BG James and Ron Killing, so I knew Conan wasn't going to wrestle because <laughs> yeah, he never yeah. seemed to wrestle. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess right there uh, versus Kid Cash and Abyss versus the New Church, uh, which is Slash, who is Wolfie D, and Sin, <clears throat> who is Kizani. <clears throat> so I didn't yeah. realize the, neither of them look, re- were recognizable for me there versus America's Most Wanted. Now uh, I'll run through this quite quickly and then I'll hit you with a question. Three live crew. Dance out, Conan hypes the crowd, Road Dog threatens to drop their hit single on next week's episode, and then a match happens, and we don't really need to talk about the match, although it's actually very good. But I want to focus on America's Most Wanted. Who did you like better as a team, Storm and Harris or Storm and Rude? Hmm. Both brought different things. Chris and Storm, uh, uh, Chris Harrison and, and James Storm, they had a real good chemistry. Like you, you could see that they had sort of molded together. And uh, Rude, no matter, it, 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 you can't say anything negative about his work. I, I mean, when he was with uh, Team Canada, when he was with uh, James Storm, Rude made it work. I mean, he he could fit into those things interchangeably. But because he was so good at being able to move in and out of those, for whatever reason. Every time I, even in the midst of Team Canada, I thought, man, this guy's a single. Like he, he's he should be off to the side somewhere. And uh, you know, and I and I was always like advocating for that. Like you know, we need to split him off, or we need to, you know, isolate him away because he he was the one guy that. And this is like no slam to any of the other guys in Team Canada. They were all great too, but they they all seemed like interchangeable parts of this thing right? This group where he looked like a standalone added on, like he was the hood ornament on the car. And, uh, you know, just, and I guess ultimately with him, it was just, he had those instincts. Like you'd see him in the ring and just at at the perfect time, he would slow his attack down and do a slow glare to the uh, camera, speed his attack up. If that was the right place to do it. And when you keep watching this, at first, it's just you're just enjoying the match. And then you start to dissect it. Okay, what's why am I so attracted and drawn to this guy? And you start to realize, well, he's got this, and he's got this, and he's got that. And he's got all these pieces that make a great singles wrestler. And so even though he and James had great chemistry, uh, Bobby's going to quite honestly have chemistry with whoever he works with. Uh, so I, for me, I, I always thought Chris – and James, because it they always seem to me to be two parts of the same thing. Like they both fit in there comfortably, and that's in no way to say that they're not compelling on their own. Uh, but and quite different personalities. Like Chris was a little bit harder, and he wasn't hard to work with, but he was harder to work with than uh, than say James at times. But then there'd be other times you'd come in expecting that chemistry, and like as you're talking to them and going over the match, you know, James would be doing this stuff and walking away and coming back five minutes <laughs> later. And you know, little things like that, that, uh, you know, when you're trying to age in a match makes it a little difficult. And, uh, uh, so, but, but they, again, they always just seem like one body with two heads and rude, uh, could, could, could fill that role. But he always, for whatever reason, in my own head, I I just see singles in him, and, and always did, no matter who he was with. To give you a slight rundown of the match, Kid Cash gets cocky, then tags in Abyss. Everyone arm rings Abyss. I, I, do you know what? It was a really good show. I, I there was a bit of a lull in the middle, but I really enjoyed the show. Quite frankly, I did, and it sounds weird, but I didn't expect to, because <laughs> and WATA gets shit on so much. Yeah, uh, and I think it's a bit of revisionist history because there was a lot of good in TNA as well in the early days as well with the pay per view, uh, the weekly pay per views as well, which so few people got to see. But there's definitely a lot of stuff worth hunting out, uh, especially in yep. 2003. Anyway, uh, 
Abyss regains control and dominates. Kid Cash and Truth end up in the ring and Cash getting Truth in a double underhook. And then for some reason, a business attired Terry Taylor runs out and low blows uh, Kid Cash twice and Truth gets the pin after a face first suplex. A very good match. Now, I don't know when we're ever going to talk about Kid Cash again. (laughs) <laughs> but Kid Cash, that's just a name that just doesn't really get brought up very much. I always remember him as looking like the guy who sort of looked like Owen Hart in TNA. He had a bit of an Owen Hart <laughs> yeah. face to me, but he was also an ECW original. So uh, any Kid Cash stories uh, that you have? Yeah, uh, Cash was... Uh, th- there's a, a handful of guys uh, through my tenure in the business that one being uh, Al Perez... And the other being Kid Cash <clears throat> had every tool. If, if there's such a thing as a great wrestler's toolbox, they had every single tool that should be in there. Uh, they had the body, they had the ability, they had the athleticism. <clears throat> they both, I think, out a little more, but both had the personality to be grandiose over the top. Uh, and they also both seemed to understand position on the card you know, how to get a match over, uh, both of them, I think cash a little bit longer, but like Al Perez, when I came in as the young skinny kid in the dressing room, you just look down across the dressing room at him and think, man, he's, he's going to be the next big thing. Like that's the guy right there. And he's all of a sudden disappeared from the business. And two, two or three years ago, WrestleCade, there's a gigantic room and, fans and tables and i i see this guy probably 10 yards down the on the opposite side of the aisle and every so often we catch each other's eyes and glance like going like damn who is that i know i know him and this goes on like for a couple hours and finally he comes walking there's a break and he comes walking over he gets like three steps out of his table like holy shit it's al perez i jumped and walk over and i said to him like he still looks great and everything i said dude like what what happened? Like you just disappeared. And he was one of those guys that gave himself like a five year plan. If, if in five years hadn't hit it, you know, it's time to move on. And uh and he stuck to that. And he's been successful since and you know, done some you know businesses and things. Uh and I, I told him I said, dude, like I <laughs> I was I I just assumed like you're the next big thing in wrestling. Like he had every the body, that look, uh, you know, the athleticism. Um, he had all those th- kid cash had the same thing. That same toolbox was as complete with kid cash as it was with anybody. And for whatever reason, again, and there's, you know, when we talk about these types of things, you know, you'll see a been a thousand wrestlers that you've seen on TV between then and you're scratching, you're going like, okay, but this guy, instead of that guy, um, you know, and, and you're hard to place it. It's hard for you to place it. Uh, all I can, the only thing that I can give as a, as an answer to that <clears throat> is ultimately beyond the toolbox, beyond the heart, beyond the desire, because if you've gone to the trouble of putting that toolbox together and gone to the trouble of getting into that shape and gone to the trouble to work from this company to that company, nobody's endeavoring to say, okay, but at this point I'm just going to walk away mm-hmm. um, or not quite get there. Everybody wants to be the world champion and that's ever owned a pair of boots. So what is it? And I think that the ultimate answer is not an answer, but it's, it's the best answer that I can come up with is there's just a whole lot of luck involved in this too. The right time, right place. You farted at the wrong time in a meeting. Mm-hmm. Those just weird things like that, that you stop and think, because I, when I look at those guys, and Bobby Roode, we talked about Bobby Roode a second ago. It confounds me that at this stage, Bobby Roode's not that guy you go, oh, yeah, man, how much money he drew and all the belts he's had and you know, top spot and all the companies. It's perplexing. It really, really is that you, that there are so many guys uh, that come and go like that. And, you know, like, what, in this humble way, you sort of like, have a tendency to compare yourself and, and, and you know, you're okay. Well, I'm good at this, but, but when you look at those guys, you go like, but they're good at this and this and this and this and this and this and that. And, uh, and for whatever reason, it just doesn't play out. Um, I think there's a whole lot of <clears throat> maybes, ifs and could have beens and all that stuff that goes into it, a whole bunch of luck 
that go into it because there's no other way to explain how did the Nile Perez not become that big thing? How was Kid Cash not an integral player uh, in those companies? In lots of other ways, Lance Storm, uh, you know, you go to these different people that you, you've you worked with and been around and seen, and you can scratch your head and go like, I just don't, on, on paper, there's everything. And yet something falls through with it. Um, and it's just one of those mysteries that I think keeps wrestling interesting, but it also keeps it perplexing to guys like me that study it and try to figure it out. And it's just, well, you know, what is it your your Churchill said? It's a mystery wrapped in a riddle surrounded by an enigma or some version of those three words. I I think that's the same thing here in wrestling. There is no form that you can say, okay, James, do these 73 things like I did, and you're going to be a world champion and a big name. It's there's just a whole lot of X factor that goes in. Mm. Uh, it also might be that people like Lance Storm or someone more modern like Damien Sandow, uh, you know, are, are in the idol Stevens. I think for the most part, maybe they're too good and therefore they're good at everything. And therefore, if you're good at everything, you end up being a utility player to plug into mm. one space or another. So it could always be that as well, where basically, oh, oh. yeah, you can, you, you can just be, you can be fit into any hole because you're any shape peg kind of thing. Yeah. And, and you know, if you go before a certain period, you know, like if you go say before the Hogan era, uh, if you were that good, you invariably were going to get pushed at some point. Mm. Now you may or may not draw when you're like, look at, uh, uh, give him names, uh, Pedro Morales, uh, becomes world champion, what, 72 and the houses go and they couldn't get, they had blackballed Bruno right prior to that. And so senior basically had to go back, would have never hired him back. If Pedro came in and those houses stayed full, you probably would have never seen a second run from from Bruno. So, you know, again, those things go into, but by the Hogan era, much to your definition, uh, if you were a Jake Roberts, if you were a Roddy Piper, if you were a Paul Orndorff, if you were a Randy Savage, you're the foil to get this guy over. And I, I think we see, see more of that. I'm sure there's probably instances prior to that. But you see that becomes more the system, more the norm as to, okay, you can do everything. So that means you're like your point, the utility guy, go out there and get this guy over. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm not sure if it, it seems to be my recollection to listen to Bruno and Dominic and all different people from that generation was that if you had the goods in the ring, you were probably going to get some kind of a push and some kind of run out of it. Um, and then ultimately, like if it, like like Pedro, where the houses go down, then it's going to be a quick thing. But Pedro didn't disappear at that point. Pedro was kept you know, like in a different place, like mid card and earlier uh, with the Intercontinental title. Um, but we see much more of that later, and it's mm. it's it's still confounding because you look at those guys and you know, uh, and it, and it just really makes you scratch your head because you. I remember being that kid in the dressing room and looking at at Al Perez and they're like. Man, this guy, he's got everything. He can do it all. And yet, you know, here and gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say that there's a million different questions I could ask to the point that we could actually turn this into a three-part. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to save a lot of these questions for a future episode. <laughs> now, the next segment is Roddy Piper and Vince Russo, of which uh, you missed on the initial watch, but you're now going to watch yeah. now and then going to pause it, and then we're going to come back one sec. Okay, and as if by magic, I've turned up with a hoodie on. I'm sorry, I was cold. Uh, <laughs> so, we uh, just watched the Roddy Piper, Vince Russo confrontation there again. And I'll tell you what, Vince Russo is one thing, but Roddy Piper is definitely another. And tell you what, they don't make him like that anymore, do they? No, no. I I, would, I don't know if you saw, as I was sitting there watching. I was watching your face throughout. I just go, you're craning yeah, I it, was... enjoying it. Yeah, I was like my my eyes were welling up because hey, I miss him. But B, like, you look at it, you, go, you know, man, you know, there. I have no inkling on what the backstory to any of this is, but my guess is that none of that stuff would have been said if it were a shoot, right? Uh, <clears throat> because if it were. Roddy would have been right out there on Russo. Uh, I think Roddy at that point of his career, you know, knew what the reputation was and knew what was being said. And I you know, figured, how can we take this and turn this, you know, 
dog stuff into dog shine. And, uh, you know, that's what he was so brilliant at, but his delivery in that, the inflection. And the reason I say that is because through there, he's doing the Roddy Piper voice, right? There's a, his real voice is very, was different from that different inflection. And when you see him making that delivery and the passion behind it, regardless of what was said before that, what would happen before that, this guy's dripping money, right? I mean, listen to the fans and you just, you're mesmerized by it. It's, you know, it's like in, in the cartoons when you, you know, you see the odor of like the, the apple pies in the oven and, the water, and here comes, you know, Fred Flintstone floating through the air to the, to the, you know, that's Roddy Piper to those of us in this business. Um, but, you know, Russo's delivery too, I was, was, was poignant and, and sharp. You know, he, he was reflecting the, the commonality of what was being said at that time. And, you know, to me, again, that's uh, knowing none of the backstory. It tells me that there was, uh, there's a thing called work shoot, right? So we're going to, uh, we're going to go out there and, you know, you say, we don't have to plan it here. You, you take your biggest dig at me and I'm going to fire back at you and let's not get angry about it you know, because it's, you know, it's not going to be personal. And, you know, like when, you know, the comment about the kids and stuff, when Russo makes the con, I don't care if your kids starve, they put the camera on Roddy and look at the, and understand in our business, we're taught to emote because it's big arena and you're playing to thousands of people at times. There is such a subtle twinge in his face that comes on. That's great acting. That's, you know, because the camera is going to pick up every one of those nuances. <clears throat> the guy in the last row didn't, didn't catch that little wince of a change in his face, but the camera on him and him present enough, present of mind enough to know that that camera's on him at that point. And he does it. And then he holds it for a second in case the camera hadn't caught it. Get it now, get it now, get the tail end of it. Um, <laughs> you know, there's times you start to think, okay, I got pretty good at this business, man. You see something like that and go, Phew. okay, I'm a JV guy. That's uh wow. Let me go through <clears throat> what the actual promo was. I'm sorry we couldn't show it all because it was just far too long. I mean, it would have been yeah, yeah. great just to see us watch it, but uh, or, or you know, Shane watch it at least. Now, Mike's out, Scotland Brave plays Roddy Piper, saunters out for a Piper's Pit. Now, I'm going to explain what he's referring to at the beginning uh, in a minute, but Piper says he's not crazy, quotes Rudyard Kipling, and that this is as real as real gets, and he straddles the line between fantasy and reality. Piper declares he's got NWA in his blood, talks family, talks drugs, didn't come here to be a nice guy, says the promoter who put the clip of his HBO comments, which I'll refer to in a minute, on the internet as a piece of shit. Piper doesn't... I actually wrote this. Piper doesn't look as well as he would do at certain times as well. But uh, we'll yep. refer to that in a minute as well because that's going to uh, play into the uh, previous <clears> paragraph <throat> I'm going to read. Uh, Vince Russo walks down to the ramp, stand stands on the announcer's table, looking sad. Piper says he made a mistake not beating him up. Russo says Piper ripped his heart out and alludes to the Owen Hart comments that Piper made the last time they went face-to-face in an NWA TNA ring where Roddy Piper says, you killed Owen Hart. Uh, Russo says that he's in TNA. Right, this is the one thing that's wrong. Russo says that Roddy Piper's in TNA because no one else will have him. Which hardly yeah. makes TNA yeah, right. seem like the <laughs> most amazing place to be. Anyway, yeah. um, it's the sort of this town ain't big enough for the both of us, and says that if Russo goes, AJ Styles goes as well. Now, Roddy Piper at the beginning of this promo starts referring to clip on the internet. His son comes up to him and says, "Daddy, you a drug addict." Now, this refers to an appearance he made on Real Sports with Brian Gumble, uh, HBO show. Uh, Roddy talked about his past drug use in wrestling and he predicted he would not be living past the age of 65. And Mm -hmm. a prediction that sadly would become prophetic because he would make it to 61 before passing Mm -hmm. away in 2015. Do you remember, because he was fired from the WWE for those comments and then shortly beforehand he ends up in TNA, but what do you remember of that time in Roddy's life with him coming back to TNA as well? Well, you know, Roddy had this thing where he would, and it had been years since I'd been around him at the, at this time frame. But you know, you know, telephone, telegraph, telewrestler, <clears throat> these are the things that 
you know, when you're paid to hear about this or hear about that. Um, you know, there was, and Roddy throughout the time that I knew him, he looked great back when I first met him. Then he went to that period where he bloated up a bit. <clears throat> and then you start to see him in like these type of segments and you can see like, okay, well, he's getting older, but it, it, like you said, he didn't look like at his healthiest. And, but then like after this, you'd see him get like back into shape. And then like a year or two later, you'd see him, you know, with the jacket be a little bit tighter. Uh, that was Roddy up and down through that time. And I never, ever, when I was around Roddy, would ever broach any kind of subject like that. We would talk about things Roddy would bring up. If I had a question, it was something to what we were doing right now. Uh, none of my business, you know, and I, and, you know, I think I, having learned from, like watching these guys and coming up in that, uh, you know, when Connor was born, there was a conscious effort by us to, uh, to not have photographs taken of Connor. Uh, to have him around the, like, if he's around the wrestling, if he went to a show with me or whatever, there was never a picture of me holding him or whatever. We'd keep that distant because we didn't want, and you know, the world's full of crazy more today, but there was crazy people then too. And, you know, somebody maybe seeing a little bit more, you know, John Lennon got shot by one of his num number one fans. Right. And so, you know, you, <laughs> you, you've gone out and you said things about flair and, Shawn Michaels and Vince and Hogan and whoever uh, <clears throat> is somebody going to take it out of my kids. So, you know, Roddy, he, he knew exactly where to straddle that line. He was brilliant with that, you know, where to bring it right up to that point that would allow him to tap into those emotions and seemingly not go over it. Now, a lot of this kind of stuff, like in hindsight, playing it back and watching it, I'm not so sure I would have this or that, but he's, at this time, the dirt sheets are really, you know, starting to catch on and, and have by then. Uh, so like he's alluding to in the, in the, in the promo, uh, uh, we've seen this and now whether his son ever came and said that to him, who knows? Uh, but you know, his life's in turmoil and you could see, well, you can read between the lines. Was he at this time using, not using yes, no, six months ago yes now no we don't know so like we're chopping in between that and trying to place these pieces into the right place roddy to me looks and talking about his kids and his kids being brought into this the reason i think roddy would have done that is not to cheaply use his kids as props or you know material for a promo but something happened there you know, there, and, and to him, that makes it real and allows him then to tap into those emotions, <clears throat> whether it was his wife asked him, a friend asked him, he can then imbue that to his son and then now make this thing seem really personal. Uh, maybe it was his son. I'm not going to say it was or wasn't, but the whole point is, is like, as you're watching this, like I'm thinking, you know, when he says the line, yeah, you wanted real. Well, I'm going to give you as real as real gets. That to me is like the the work shoot. Okay, I'm going to tell you this because I've never said this before, and that puts everybody on guard. Like I would say, you know, shooting right. It's uh, uh, and it, it it exposes a nerve just enough that allows him to tap into it, but it also allows the foil to play off of it. When you're with somebody like Roddy, because he was so close to vest like that. Roddy didn't come to say, okay, we're going to do a promo. I'm thinking like, I'm going to say this stuff. And you say this back. And it wasn't like that. It was, you respond to my stuff and I'll respond to your stuff. <clears throat> that in watching that again, the mastery of it, <clears throat> but I, I would love to find out th the real backstory to it. Like what really did happen at that point, him being fired over that, that would, you know, allows him to pull it in. But those guys that were always great, very few great to that level, but were able to do that. They would pull something in just close enough to the line where it would make perfect sense to somebody. It could be the biggest work in the world, but then they would say, well, you know, he's talked about his family in the past or, you know, everybody knows he's been fired. What, it, it, without being in that moment and knowing exactly where we are in this timeline that would be the interesting thing to me to watch this but i sense 
uh, as best you can with a guy that's as phenomenal as Roddy is doing that kind of thing. Uh, that the the involvement of his children, uh, the the comment of your uh, don't care if your kids starve, uh, the re- you can hear it in the wrestling fans. You know, there's that bit of a swell coming. Like, Ooh, that's not the right thing to say to him. You know, and and bringing it in, which which tells me at least a little birdie in my ear that this is Roddy pulling strings, uh, knowing how how close to play to that. And would love to talk to Kitty sometime and ask her, her what was her take at this time, because if you're coming that close, you know, when you're in the in, in a back and forth like this in front of a live audience, once something is said and the cameras are rolling, you can't. Oh, hold on, let's back up. Let's drop that line out. Let's say this line instead. You know, it, it, without question, there would have had to have been times where his family, his loved ones, would have thought, "Yeah, that's a little bit too close to home." You know, it's. uh a boy, the mastery of it and the delivery. So, like, what's give me the give me what else you're going to say with it? Oh, I'm, nothing. I'm sort of sucked in right now. No, 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 uh, nothing with it. I was actually going to follow up with a question about Vince Russo. What do you think of him purely as an on-screen talent? He knows what to do, right? I mean, his, his delivery there, the, his timing. He's allowing the crowd to get in, giving it time to breathe. He's, you know, they're not stepping on each other. Like, so semantically, <clears throat> and Vince knows this, about, you know, we're good friends, but uh, there's things that he did in his booking that I would, wouldn't do. I uh, things that I, I wouldn't go to. Um, and you know, and quite frankly, I'm sure if I was booking somewhere, he'd probably come, come and say, I would have done it that way. I would have tried it like that. Uh, like some like chocolate, some like vanilla. Um, but on camera he's he's good on camera he knows where to and good in a different way like paul Heyman is very much more like a wrestling promo delivery guy i think russo comes off more like the the office guy that's standing his ground and <clears throat> i don't get the sense that when i'm watching him okay well roddy's great and then when vince starts to talk it's it's more of a work it it, it He's he's holding his own on stage as much as you can with a guy like Roddy Piper. Mm. <sighs> Vignettes with I mean because we just both watched it then it's an intense thing to watch quite frankly but it's one of Very. those things where I just think God with Roddy Piper, no one today can even hold. You know they're not in the same league as Piper. No, in something mm. like that, not even the best talkers are, and that's a shame. Yeah, and they and they can do nine thousand more moves three times as fast as he could do them. Mm. Uh, Roddy in, in the ring with, with my little two cents for what it's worth. Roddy wasn't the greatest catch as catch can wrestler. Right. I mean, he, you know, but, but, but again, when you're watching, because he's so compelling on this level of it. And like you'd said last episode, that's the, the buildup, right? The buildup is what makes it. And uh, he said the line in there, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that made, you know, put WrestleMania on the map. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, if you know that whole story, you know, Vince is borrowing money from the mob and everything else, uh, which just two cents thrown in here, uh, which makes it all that more ignominious. What Vince does to him later when he sends him out, his music playing, he gets 10 yards to the curtain. And he stops his music. You know, that's that's chicken shit. That's podunk, you know, but if you just see just some kind of little dig to, to be a dig. And when somebody does for you like that. Uh, anybody that really understands the industry knows that Piper was the oil that made that WrestleMania engine go. Hogan was the personality, but that personality is only going to get over as far as that foil pushes him over. And uh, if you've borrowed a bunch of bucks from the, from the, 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 the loan shark people, you know, and, and don't pay that back, bad things could have happened. So whatever personal differences you have aside, you know, if, if 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 in Vince's world he considers himself a businessman, I'm sure he does. Then you need to separate the personal from the business, right? And to do that to someone like Roddy is just again so ju- ju- you can't say junior varsity because that does a disservice to junior varsity. It's it's uh it's not worthy of a talent as prodigious as Roddy Piper, and and so you know soapbox time. Uh. 
Yeah, bring your microphone a little closer. I'm sounding like Joe Rogan now, because that's what every, every, all the old <laughs> Joe Rogans, every four minutes, like, bring your microphone closer. Okay, <laughs> yeah. next next thing is a vignette with D'Lo Brown and Sonny Siaki from a previous show where D'Lo gets thrown onto a table. Then next week, Siaki holds a funeral for Brown, but Brown is in the casket and attacks Siaki and Trinity. TNA have done a good job catching me up as to why at least these people are fighting. But the other thing I was thinking of was, wow, Sonny Siaki is the latest person Vince Russo is trying to do a rock copycat with. Because he tried it with Booker T uh, in WCW mm-hmm. to the point, I don't know if you noticed, he ended up having the rock bottom and the $500 shirts and the catchphrases. Yeah. Sonny yeah. Siaki's the same thing. He even does the same segment four years after the fact with the with the funeral. And then obviously someone all It's weird in wrestling. Someone always has to jump out of a casket. It's yeah. like, it's like yeah. a rule. So there's either that, and like if there's a cake, someone's face will go in it. <laughs> sure. So just yeah. one of those hard and fast wrestling rules. Um, yes. D'Lo Brown versus Sonny Siaki with, uh, Siaki with Trinity. Casket is in the ring. Audience is great here. Big spot for D'Lo hitting the uh, uh, written down low, low down, uh, the frog splash on Siaki. And then Jamal from Three Minute Warning, the future Umaga, uh, who was fired in June t- 2003 uh, from WWE for getting into a bar fight debuts and helps Siaki win. Any memories of uh, I think he's called Ecmo uh, in TNA. He's he uh, he calls himself Ecmo cuz he, he that was his name in MLW back in the day as well. But any memories of Umaga as uh, we best know him? Yeah, it, for me uh, any of those guys that came in from with that Samoan island background <clears throat> within Two or three steps, they're all connected and all related in some way. And it just seems to be like in the DNA gene pool there uh, that they're all, regardless of size, like you see those big guys like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, Coquina originally, but then uh, later uh, Yoko, uh, yeah. Yoko and, and watching him move around even at 500 pounds. Uh, and, and I can assure you, like him just walking around, was was chore for him a chore? But you know, he uh, was just walking down the street. But he'd get in that ring. It's just something in their DNA that, man, they just go. And it doesn't matter if they're that big or they're this big. I mean, they just get in that ring and just move around like lightweights. Uh, but they also all know how to work, and that's the that's the key to those guys. It's uh, you know, so like when he came in. Those guys, they're they're always a great attitude. Uh, they come in that if you need them over, no problem. They get them over. Always professional to work with, and uh, you know. But even young as he was at that point, and and he, I don't know how he, how old he was, but young in the business, they came in and there was a professionalism about him that you didn't see in a whole lot of the guys that have been around a lot longer. And I don't know if they sit around the. Thanksgiving table and say, okay, like when you get your first job, do it like this and do it like that. Uh, he was 30 uh, at the time, I should say. Yeah. yeah. But it had, hadn't really been around the business in a big way yet. And so, uh, you know, the, the, my experience of working with those guys really boiled down to uh, working like as agent or talking, you know, the guy in the dressing room, they come and ask you, hey, I got an idea and run things through it th- that way. Um, and I don't recall him doing that quite often. It was just sort of like he went to the ring and did it. And, uh, you know, he, uh, easy to work with, I guess is probably the best way to put it. Like from the office personnel down, uh, made it easy to to do that side of it. And some of those guys that were like pulling in, I told you, like, you know, James would be off like sometimes floating around or Chris would be late coming to the, to the get together, uh, you never had any of that kind of issue with those guys. They were just always boom, 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 boom. Whatever needed done was done. Next segment: Don Callis is on the phone while Scott Hudson. I was quite. I was really like Scott Hudson. Uh, I interviews did too. him. Uh, I used to actually watch WSI. I think and uh, comments occasionally. Uh, Callis cuts a promo on Jerry Lynn. Eric Watts confronts Callis. We were talking about Eric Watts quite recently, in fact, and says AJ Styles versus Jerry Lynn is happening. Then Russo turns up and takes Callis away. Now I asked you before about Vince Russo as a performer. Man, Don Callis, I, for what it's worth, I always had two people in the 90s that I just thought, how can, you know, like you said, with Al Perez and Kid Cash and a couple of mm-hmm. others, how can the business have missed on Scorpio <laughs> and Don Callis? Yeah. And, and Scorpio <clears throat> himself has come out, he's basically said it was his fault <laughs> uh, to a point, which is <laughs> fine. But uh, Don Callis, I, 
he was one of the best talkers in the WWF in the Attitude Era, and that's saying something. And just he never seemed to be appreciated in the company. And then he goes to ECW, gets to be Cyrus the Virus, and then yeah. but in TNA, and then he's gone for twenty years. But Don Callis, yeah, f- phenomenal what he does. And, and you know, it, it, again, it says like, what is that X factor? Who knows? But I do know like the one thing about uh, Don, at least then. He wasn't, he would come in, do his job, do it well, and then be gone back to the hotel, back to Canada and back the next time. And I think by this time, like in the nineties, we had sort of hit that paradigm of, okay, you know, like the Bruce Pritchard thing, I'm going to hang around, you know, it always reminded me of like that, that cartoon, like where there's the big bulldog and then there's a little dog. That's my friend, you know, Butch and, and, uh, you know, jumping all around. Uh, those promoter types and, and booker types like that constant assuaging of their, uh, of their ego, right? Oh, you're doing a great job, boss. That's fantastic boss. Good show boss. Um, and I, Don never struck me as that kind of guy. He'd come in, he's going to hit a home run with whatever you give him. He's going to give it solid. And then, okay, just like one of the boys going to put your boots in the bag and go back to the hotel or go back to the airport. And I, that'd be my, again, just a guess on my part. Uh, but I, I always found Dawn to be very compelling. And most importantly, in that rule, uh, when you're doing the commentary, the rule is not for you to get out there and recite the 20 jokes that you've remembered or m- memorized. It's to go out there and get over what's on screen. Mm-hmm. So like when I would do color, mine was more from an analytical point of view because I didn't have the, the wit or the humor that say Jesse or, or uh, Bobby Heenan did. Uh, Don would go out there and wing it. Like he, he, I don't know if he sat around and wrote lines to himself or whatever, but he was always doing that, getting over whatever's on camera, whatever you're viewing at home. He's going to be talking about that and giving his rub to it. And uh, that's not easy to do. That is, it may look a lot easier than it's supposed to. I understand, like, he has almost no inkling of what these guys are going to do in the ring right now. He might know the finish. Uh, he might know even the heat spot, but he doesn't know how they're starting it or what they're going to work, how they're going to come out of it. You know, so to to be able to sit down on the camera and provide the color, which is what the color guy is supposed to do, the color and the flavor and the dye to that match to put it in the proper context and getting it home. Again, not an easy thing to do. And Don's always been professional at that. Um, why he hadn't been a bigger name you know like you get the, like the, the mount rushmore you know comment uh who's Mount rushmore of commentators well you know I, I think very few people put his name in there but once you throw his name out on the table and like well, you know he was better than this one or better than that one uh and how you know and now it pops back in again after all these years uh <laughs> as you can tell i've always gone along great with don mm-hmm. you know but he uh it's it's perplexing again just one of those things as the what why wasn't he one of those big names in wrestling why wasn't he the next joey styles or jim ross who knows uh fun fact for you but you probably will know this one is that when eric bischoff and fusion media were going to buy wcw they put in place a new commentary team for nitro joey styles and don Callis. they were yeah. going to replace and then they you know just another thing i suppose uh <laughs> that got in the way beyond their control now, yeah. next match, six-man X-Division match, Nozawa, Chris Saban, and X-Division champion Michael Shane, Shawn Michaels' cousin, who mm-hmm. I thought would go further, quite f- f- frankly, and he just sort of, he just sort of uh, seemed to disappear. Uh, he was claiming six six foot at height, which he didn't look six foot to me. <laughs> yeah. Versus, in his TNA debut, Showtime Eric Young. And uh, although the graphic that came up said David Young. And also Frankie Kazarian and Juventud Guerrera. Uh, I've got to admit, it was just a load of spots and I wasn't really paying attention. And then uh, someone wins and then uh, Frankie Kazarian starts talking talking to a blonde girl at ringside who looks remarkably like chastity, but it wasn't. (laughs) Now, uh, we'll move on from that. Now, there's a vignette of the fallen angel Christopher Daniels attacking Jeff Jarrett, then Dusty Rhodes the next week. Jarrett gets uh, the old slaps and slap nuts guitar shot revenge, and then there's a Clockwork House of Fun match with uh, JJ versus Daniels and a load of other people. And Daniels cuts a promo saying he isn't done with Jarrett, and now this is going to be a recurring theme through this show as well. 
I had completely forgotten, unbelievably, that Christopher Daniels had such an overtly religious gimmick at the time. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, we're talking 2003, we're not talking 1983, but do you remember this being a point of controversy at the time, no. him going out, you know, with the with the robes and the little white deal? No, I, I, I wasn't privy to that as I recall. Um, you know, there's anytime you deal with those topics, there are <clears throat> today, obviously politics, uh, religion of the past when Sab or when, uh, uh, Raven and Sandman did the upside down crucifix, you know, there's things that you, at least the business used to, <laughs> if you can view the, use this word with the wrestling business, there was a cl at least an a, a, a basal level of class in the business. Let's stay away from those things because again, you know, as the country back, the, as we go further back was even more and more religious. Uh, you can see where that might've caused controversy, but the way that he played it, like it never came off to me as being condescendingly uh, anti-religious or, or religious either way. Uh, and I, I'm trying to remember if he had the tattoo then or not, uh, where he had the wings on his back. Um, you know, but no, I don't remember any overt, like, Hey, tone this down or tell him to not do this as much. I don't recall that. Was there a, like live controversy at the time? No, no, it's just something I was thinking about because it was really yeah, overt, yeah. but similarly, you could say the same thing about father James Mitchell, where it's very much like a devil gimmick and it's over the top and everything. So probably just, I mean, people probably just didn't care at the time, uh, yeah. about that kind of thing. <laughs> we just sort of just got over it a bit. Uh, Christopher Daniels. I don't think in any of the podcasts, really, his name comes up very often, which it should, because he was one of the real homegrown stars of TNA, even though he'd been in yes. uh, WWF very briefly and a couple of other places, and he'd just been around the business for years at that point. He was uh, one of the real stars of the early years whose uh, name might get lost in the shuffle more than an AJ Styles might do. But any more yeah. thoughts on uh, Mr. Daniels there? Yeah, there, I, I, you know, when we talk about that era <clears throat> of uh, TNA, it seemed to me that at that time, our one ace in the hole, our one bright spot <clears throat> was that X division. There was at the heavyweight division, there was a whole lot of in and out. The, you know, this big name comes in and it's gone. This big name negotiates coming, but doesn't come. There was a whole lot of that. But the X division was that one standard that we knew during each show we could put out there and that segment was going to, you know, rocket. And AJ gets a lot of that credit and rightfully so. But there were a lot of guys into that, in that X division that were bringing that to the table. So it wasn't just the AJ style segment, although it would often showcase AJ. Christopher Daniels was one of those guys too, that was out there and, you know, would often wrestle AJ or they'd have, you know, the, those X division matches where they had the cable crossed over uh, and, and they were getting really creative. Now, some could argue today that this was the, the foundational points of spot monkey. But uh, to me, I remember a lot of conversations with AJ, especially uh, trying to wrap his brain around the, 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 the storytelling and the psychology part. How can we make this make sense? And, uh, you know, that, that was a, a quite often discussion with AJ and, you know, making it make sense. And Christopher Daniels, too. Chris would come around and say, can I ask a question on something? And he would lay it down and say, okay, how, how can we get here? Uh, and always attentive. You know, the, all those guys, Michael Shane, all those guys then, Frankie Kazarian, all of those guys were eager to learn. It, it, it wasn't like you're hearing today with nothing like, well, why ask Shane? He can't teach us anything. Or why ask Dusty? There's nothing he can tell us. Uh, they seemed quite interested in learning and, and, and taking it in. But by proxy, I think as the company began to lean on them more, uh, they were, how do I say this without like sounding controversial or maybe saying it the wrong way? As the company leaned on them more and more, I think they began to feel that pressure more and more. And so felt the compulsion to try to, I guess, throw more of what they could do in there uh, because, you know, hey, we got a 20-minute a match on, on the, on the pay-per-view tonight. 
And that's a pretty good chunk of time for television. And so instead of doing what would have made better sense and to do that stuff and then set it up and, and come to it, it became, let's just throw more of that stuff in. And, you know, and I think there was a wow factor. There's always going to be a wow factor to it, especially from fans that have grown up and watched, you know, wrestling style matches. But I think that, you know, the argument could be made that this is like where we start to really see it take hold in America of what would become spot monkey. And then suddenly it's just moves for moves sake. Those guys, especially Christopher and, and, uh, uh, AJ and certainly Michael Shane and, uh, really all of them, like uh, Sonny, they were, all those guys were coming and, you know, asking questions. And when you sat down to go over matches with them, they were, uh, you know, typically Jerry would do the agenting of those matches, but they would come over and ask something, but you, you could see them and sitting with, with Jerry, like there was a long, you, know, you might walk by an hour ago and come back an hour later and they're still going over something, mm. you know? So like, it was clear to me that they were being diligent about the, uh, about the craft. And I think as TNA began to lean on them more, <clears throat> it started putting more pressure on them. But where TNA made the, the mistake with the X division was suddenly we're not going to disband the X division. We're just going to start throwing the X division guys in with all the other guys mm -hmm. and sort of muddy that up. And, and that was where I think it started taking it off. I mean, it's face it. If you're going to be in the ring with say Kevin Nash, you're not going to be able to go in there and do quite as much of that. It, it, so it, it tones it down and pulls it away from that. And it, 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 suddenly the X division, the one bright spot that we had, the X division was sort of just wrapped into everything else with no real explanation to it other than we just do it. And, you know, there was a whole lot of different things going on at that time like that, um, that weakened the X division, watered it down and then assimilated it into the other stuff. And there was never any real explanation to that as to the one bright spot, the fans were coming and seeing and loving. Now, suddenly we're seeing less of that because they're joining them up in different ways and pair and pairing them up with opponents that may or may not be able to showcase them the same way. So, uh, it was noticeable to us. I know Jerry and I would talk about it quite often. And I think Jerry at the time felt sort of like they were being squeezed out. Because you know he was concerned about like you know are they going to keep him around because if they don't have an X division they're not going to have that mm -hmm. uh, just a whole lot of those types of business wrestling concerns that come up that don't even be broached there's the, you just create them to create the issue. Now uh, Jeff Jarrett's Titan Tron plays. I just want to say that even in 2003 the graphics were atrocious. <laughs> for uh, uh, England and uh, maps of England and Japan and Scotland and New Zealand and that horrendous My World music. And I'm sorry, I have always hated that theme. <laughs> uh, Jarrett comes to the ring, wants a title shot. Russo doesn't care about the business. Chris Daniels is hunted, goes to commentary. Now, I, I hope we don't end on this because it is it just how sort of the timings ended up. Uh, the next match features a chap called Mad Mikey. Do you remember who that is more famously? No. Mad Mikey, Mike Lockwood, Crash Holly. Crash Holly, yes, 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 yes. I when I saw the, uh, I I told you I had the issue we were having with YouTube last night, <clears throat> and I saw the split second. It was a split second shot, and uh, who was in the ring with him? Uh, he was a uh, Swinger and Diamond, and his tag team partner was Shot Boy. Yes. And as it was a split second there, and I said to to Moose, I said, "Is that was that Crash Holly?" And he said, "And by the time he turned, looked, he didn't see it." And then we couldn't find it again for mm -hmm. the next thing. So yeah, but but you know, when you ask me people's real names, I some of them I know, not a whole bunch of them I don't. No, so. as, as, um, no specifically, I say Mad Mikey because obviously Crash Holly's a WWE owned mm -hmm. trademark. Uh, Sharp Boy and Mad Mikey are in the back. Mad Mikey is annoyed uh, that Sharp Boy is playing with an inflatable robot. Now, <clears throat> Norman Smiley was originally teaming with Sharp Boy, but then he leaves TNA and Mad Mikey replaces him. The next match is Mad Mikey and Sharp Boy versus Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger. Mikey has a very similar trunks on as when he was cra uh, Crash Holly. And the one thing I want to bring up is that Mad Mikey walks the bottom rope, which he called preschool. 
instead of old school, <laughs> which I thought was very, very clever. Uh, okay. Then uh, in the match itself, Diamond gets thrown out of the ring by Sharp Boy, and he's meant to land on Glenn Gilberti, Disco Inferno, but he's sort of like miles off, so he ends up just going, ah, just absolutely reaching just to just <laughs> yeah. to flick Disco so he reacts. Uh, Glenn stops the pin, then Mikey attacks him and leaves Sharp Boy alone in the ring to get dual teamed and pinned. Now, the reason why I didn't want to end on this or try and end on something else is we can't mention Mad Mikey, Mike Lockwood, Crash Holly. Uh, we have to talk about him because he would pass away about six weeks later. His run in TNA yeah. was very short indeed and, you know, a very, very sad end for him. I don't know how much time he spent with Mike uh, Crash. He was in ECW very briefly, mm-hmm. as Aaron O'Grady, briefly, but yeah. any, any memories of Crash? Just, you know, the <clears throat> real exuberant guy, and I think he was the type of guy, uh, because of his size, and before they created the Crash Holly and... <clears throat> Then all these subsequent takes on it, he, he seemed very appreciative. Like he loved being in the business. And when I heard that about him, <clears throat> some short time later, uh, we're we're on the tail end of the time when this genocide happens in wrestling. Right there's these, you know, people hanging themselves and you know, overdosing and dying in car wrecks and so many different things. Uh, that like when you first get the phone call, even before you've heard what it is, there's that voice in your head that tells you what it is. And the whole time you're saying, please don't let it be that, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it it's th- that dirty little secret about wrestling, you know, that wasn't so secret. Uh, but, you know, because he was such an ebullient guy, you know, when you watched him when you were in a room with him. You know, he was much like that little dog. I took as my buddy Butch. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Butch's buddy, and, and he he was like that in the dressing room. And so <clears throat> he was one of those guys that you always enjoyed seeing. Uh, you never went, oh, gonna do a match with him tonight. You know, it's and there are a few guys like that, but uh, because they're just you know pains in the rear ends. Some of them, you never had that with him. He was uh, if you went out and told him to slobber on a bone and wag his tail he would have done it he was just so thrilled to be around the business and i think because at that time the the x division we've just spoken about but that was like opening doors and suddenly you didn't need to be seven foot tall or 397 pounds plus uh you know and there's a guy that 10 years before would have had almost no chance in the business and now sees the opportunity and then you know cruelly this this other thing happens uh, a few weeks, like you said, what six weeks later, something like that, yeah. and it's yeah, and and it's it, you know it was just for for us in the business, uh, at least my take on it was it had reached the point where it was so ubiquitous and so common that you just assumed okay, okay sooner or later I'm going to be on deck, it's my turn, and because of you know again this is like right that time frame. <clears throat> of getting off the Oxycontin that, you know, there's that big thing on my shoulder, you know, worried about like, Hey, is that going to get me? And I, I I think it was just this constancy uh, of it happening, regardless if it was an accident or whatever, uh, you know, that, that certainly I was paying attention to, you know, my brain was still cognizant enough to say, Hey dude, like wake up or this is going to happen. Um, but you, you, you never. There was never one of those calls. It didn't matter who the person was. There was never one of those times you got any of those calls. You went, oh, I didn't get along with him anyway, so it doesn't matter. It, it, each one of them like knocked a little bit more of the shine off of wrestling. It just like see, now suddenly became a slog. You know, like like who can survive this? It's like now a gauntlet, and can you make it to the other side? So uh, yeah, but he he was a good guy. Uh, that really loved being around the business. And I think when you leave and you see a little smile, he'd always put on his face, you know, that, that was really him. That was like that, that side of him, like, man, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and just thrilled with it. Um, so I'm happy before what happened that he was able to experience that and get in there and, and do those things, like walk the bottom rope or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, the creative stuff, the fun stuff that just would like that cartoon was supposed to 
evoke from you. The same type of response from him. Uh, like when you go out there and do the walk the bottom rope or do those t- little things. But you know, I, I see him doing that side, you know, the little bit of a grin that he would do. That was, you know, so over the top that it, that sort of like became like the snapshot in your head of him. I we're actually going to leave it there. I'm afraid. Uh, in fact, I'll I'll just do uh, one last vin- uh, the backstage thing, and I actually wrote here to the back because it's TNA. Jeff Jarrett attacks some of the altar boys as Scott uh, altar boys, Chris Daniels altar boys. Mm-hmm. Scott Hudson romantically narrates the action in the background. I've also written he did seem to almost quite romantically narrate it at one point. Some uh, <laughs> long haired altar boy tries to throw Jarrett over some stairs through a table onto concrete, but JJ reverses it, and old long hair takes a pretty bad spill. JJ returns to ringside demanding Daniels and we shall leave it there for now. So thank you very much everybody for watching as I say all the time. We have a new episode out of Franchise University with Shane Douglas every single Tuesday and of course on YouTube, Franch- uh, sorry, Shane Douglas official and I can feel my brain melting now. So I'm going to, <laughs> in fact, Shane Douglas questions as well if you want your question answered by the franchise himself on a future episode. But for now, Shane, take us away. Hey, you've been listening to The Learning Tree right here on Franchise University. Tune back in next week, next Tuesday, to find out what we got next.